10. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only 10 Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. Only 10. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon members will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Adventure Tackle, they'll get 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin rods. They will also get access to our private Facebook group community, weekly and monthly Patreon giveaways, specific Patreon members only content, and so much more. Plus the satisfaction of knowing you are the reason that this show can continue. Again, we are only 10 Patreon supporters away from hitting our next major milestone. Thank you guys so much for all your help. Link in the episode description down below. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. I missed everybody. We I know we, last weekend we had our wonderful Memorial's Day. Everyone was able to take a break. I was able to spend time with with my wife doing some horse things. If you guys don't know, I'm a cowboy in my other life doing uh, equestrian stuff all over the East Coast. So that was a fun little break, and I kind of figured I didn't know how to talk to a mic in fr front of a live audience again. We got a lot of things coming up, though, in our area. We have the Toyota series coming back to the Potomac. That place just gets pounded like a $20 hooker, and it's that time of year where I could literally cover a tournament on the Potomac every weekend and it but it also produces which is fascinating we'll be getting that winner on too of course after that tournament goes down i also have a biologist hopefully that'll be coming on to talk about some of the sav on the title potomac i'm trying to get that nailed down for late june july and i also have an episode that i've been sitting on for a while with the head of the clemson uh fish uh biology department to talk about uh alabama bass so that'll be launching here too this week but instead of all the nerdy science stuff that we get into on the channel we have a fun episode i had the honor of meeting this individual from brian of the bass cast and i remember brian was trying to go to bed or, or do something and we were just talking non-stop even the camera wasn't on and i was like i really really want to get this guy on not just to talk fishing but his story because the thing I really love about this is just understanding the people behind it, more of like a biography thing. And so we're going to start with that before we get into like the fishy side of things. So you know him as the Bass Geek, but his real name behind the myth, because there you have Batman and you have the Bruce Wayne, and this is Hank Rogers. Without further ado, sir, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Anytime, man. It's an honor to be here. YouTube is a crazy place, and <laughs> yeah. I know I know kids nowadays, I, I believe it was stated that most people in kindergarten, first grade, they say what they want to grow up to be is a content creator and influencer. But that first crop, like you, SB Fishing, the Googans, people like that, you were that first gen, if, if, if I could say that. And second, 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 gen. second. Yeah. How did this fall in your lap then? How did this all start? Man, uh, you know, I describe doing YouTube fishing as stepping in dog crap that's what it's kind of like every day you and know, that's you want <laughs> you want to scrape it off your foot and just walk away from it three times a day and twice on sunday but you know i really like i'm i'm lucky like you know i i tell people all the time i really do enjoy doing it now it's such a habit whether it's a good habit or bad habit i haven't decided yet but, but uh you know to be honest with you you know I, I wanted to grow up to be a football coach. That's kind of what I wanted to do. High school and, or college? Uh, uh, any of it. You know, I just I just loved it. It's a great game. And got to do it. You know, coached for 13 years at my alma mater. And then decided that I pretty much really wanted to murder kids more than I wanted to teach them. <laughs> what, what age group? Uh, man, I've coached it all. Uh, but I spent probably the last seven, eight years, uh, at the, the varsity high school level. So, you know, it, so I taught before I got a real corporate job, I taught kids for 16 years baseball. And I definitely felt like each age group was unique where college, yeah. I really think it's turnkey. It is there. 
they're you're, they're adults. You're dealing with more mm -hmm. egos. There's yeah. coaching at age eight. It's like two plus two is four. It, 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 with your high school, where was that at? Was it kind of just more fighting parents versus being able to teach oh, the kids? Yeah, and you know, parents are tough because they're not there every day. And I get it because I, I unfortunately had, you know, I coached my son. Ooh. And, uh, you know, so I would tell the coaches, I was like, look, if he's out of line, and he was a lineman too, so I coached offensive and defensive line. So I was like, look, I'm, I'm just going to send him to you. You know, I don't want to be in this cycle so if he done something wrong i just be like go to coach um and that worked out pretty good but you know i love film mm -hmm. and you know those kids I i'll tell you the last group of kids now i coached at a very small school traditionally this school only had you know if we were lucky and it was a good year we had 26 players I'm pretty sure we were one of the smallest schools in Virginia. So it's not one of those deals where like you're, you can't be like, get off the team. You're sorry. You're lazy. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to find different ways to motivate. Squeeze and, blood from a rock type of yeah, deal. Yeah. And you know, the last season that I was there and again, you know, a lot of good kids there and I don't mean anything by, you know, great program. They're having a lot of success here as lately. And, but the last year I was there, we had a pretty tough season and I'll never forget. I had 12 seniors and at a school like that, when you have 11 to 12 seniors, you should be good. But those particular seniors never spent a day in the weight room. They're four years up there and, and football, it, it's a year round sport. I mean, it is. And so I'll never forget. I was standing out there one day and we, we had experienced a few injuries and uh, one of them looked at me and they said, Hey, they said, why are we, why are so many of us getting hurt? I said, well, boys, I said, in life, you make decisions. And I said, you all made the decision to not put the work in, in the weight room for four years. Mm. And I said, and when we go out there and we play teams, Sometimes you're the rock and sometimes you're the Twinkie getting the stuff and beat out of you. And I said, in this situation, which one do you think you are? <laughs> That's, you know, they got the stuff and beat out of them because they were soft. And I, and I love those kids, but I mean, I'm never going to lie to you, you know, mm -hmm. and they knew that. And I was like, but you know, now we can work on fundamentals and we can be fundamentally strong but when you got a weak core and you got a weak thighs, you got weak legs and you're on the offensive line. No. And I explain it to people. It's like co coaching and your skills, the, you know, whether it's how you set up in the position, how you tackle, how you swing a bat, that is your ability to drive a car. Yeah. But you need to make sure that you're doing a big block V8 because no matter how skilled of a driver you are, you can't win in a Prius and your body yeah. is the car and you've got to build that sucker up. How did this translate to your love of film? And did you do a lot of editing back then before YouTube? Like what? So what was funny in high school is that I actually took a a class, and so I, you know, I either wanted to do uh, sports broadcasting or coaching. Like I knew I wanted to be around it somehow, and so I took. Uh, we were lucky enough. We had a, a great, I mean, a full on studio. Like now, now I'm old. So like, this is all like tape to tape, <laughs> you know, there, there's no computers back then. Like this is like, like pre windows 98, you know, I didn't graduate until 94. So, you know, uh, but, uh, but I'll never forget, you know, we, you know, so I learned how to edit the hard way, you know, uh, and, and all that stuff and learn, you know, film work and, and and all that uh you know took that my junior and senior year but then you know met my wife and things happened and we got pregnant my senior year and college kind of took a back seat to all that and you know I, i'd fished forever you know from the time i was 10 i think you know on uh just you know pond fishing bass fishing which around me there's not a lot of ponds so you i, I was lucky enough i had my papa's boat up on big cherry and, you know, back again, back then, you know, uh, during the summers, we just get dropped off and we'd take the trolling motor. You know, I think we, me and my brother, I was probably 13 and my brother and my 
uh, best friend. We're like 12. So we just hop on a John boat. It's electric motor only. And they wouldn't nobody up there. And we just fish all day and swim and, you know, do that sort of stuff. And uh, as I got older, you know, and started fishing a little bit more, a little bit more serious, got out of college, was able to afford my first bass boat. You know, I'd, I'd run all through college. Like we'd fished out. I'd fished out a little green John boat for just ever. And finally was able to afford my first bass boat right around like 2004, I think, like a little used one. And of course, you know, right around then is when, you know, to, is, I think it's right around then I seen, or right around 2010, I, you know, I seen Tactical Bassin. And they were talking about GoPros, how, you know, you really should get a GoPro, whether you want to do a YouTube channel or not. And they said it's like game film and so that mm -hmm. went bing, and i was like okay i was like okay but now me i mean i've got a pretty good memory and most people will tell you they're like man this dude can remember every spot offshore he doesn't have to know because like you know i grew up triangulating you know we didn't have gps or maps and uh you know so i i could do all that and i i would have swore to you before i snuck the uh handy cam from uh, the football team out that weekend and strapped it to the back deck of my boat <laughs> just to see right around the time that the Alabama rig had first come out. So I pull right up to this spot and my first one, I catch two small mouth on Alabama rig. It's first uh, Alabama rig That's catch so cool. I'd ever had. And, uh, and I remember sitting here thinking, Oh man, they, they hit that uh, while it was falling by that tree. I just threw at that. And I uh, got home and he was like halfway to the boat. And I was like, there's no way, you know, and you, you, you forget those little things. Like I noticed yeah. I gave it a quick turn and uh, that's kind of what led to the whole YouTube thing, man. I just, I was like, there's gotta be a way to edit all these hours of me not catching fish down. <laughs> and so it's so uh, interesting when you say mm. that, because just from the, to watch your film. I think everyone can relate that's played a sport, but every time you put a GoPro in your boat, you're assuming you're trying to be a content creator. And yeah. it, it does two things. You can check the feed to see where you can improve. And it also, it's just like a dash cam in a car. Yeah. If anything ever happens, you have photographic proof to say like, nope, this is what happened on the water. Yeah. And, and why not have that safety in that? And I've seen when I've edited some footage, that I'm, I need to get my situational awareness up. Just because you have yeah. scope on the boat doesn't mean you shouldn't pop your head up and where are the herrings? Is there something busting? Like, it, yeah. it, I wouldn't have noticed that unless I had footage. Yeah. And that and that's true. And, you know, I, I kind of found a free editor and edited that up. And then, you know, my best friend who I worked with and my son and my daughter's like, you need to put this on YouTube. And I'm like, there ain't no way. I'm like the first 13 year old foul mouth troll comes up. I'm going to be like, son, I'm on, I'm on, I'm an IT guy. I'm going to find where you live. I'm coming with my belt and the bar soap. And I'm going to whoop you like your mama should, have, you know, if you're talking like that, you know, because I mean, my, at that time, you know, one of the things I did was scream at 13 to 18 year old kids every day. <laughs> You know, so uh, so I just didn't know if I could handle that. But, um, you know, fortunately, that's one thing. I know there's a lot of crap in the fishing community that we can kind of carry in. But realistically, man, 90 percent of everybody that fishes, they're just good people. You know, they're, they're good people. You know, it really is even meeting the kids like I do a lot of shows and. You know, I was probably one of those people that sat around and watched all the political stuff and thought the world was coming to an end. And then you go and you meet these young men that 100%. fish. And you go and you meet these young men that fish, and they're, yes, sir, no, sir. And I'm like, stop calling me, sir. And they're like, yes, sir, I'll stop calling you, sir, sir. <laughs> you know, just call me Hank or whatever. It, it, and it, it really is, gives yeah. you, like, you're like, okay, mm -hmm. man, good, good parenting and good people are still out there. It is so interesting because this comes up in conversation more and more where TikTok was created in 2016 and Facebook, YouTube, 2008, 2006. We are just getting to the zeitgeist in this where this is part of our DNA. I think you and I were the last generation. I remember because I'm a millennial. We didn't have Facebook and all no, this stuff. Yeah. And, and so, and it's, 
when any, I'm not successful on YouTube by any means compared to, to so many people I'm friends with, including you, but you get these people in the comments section and it's easy for me to just realize like, they're not, they're not people. They're not real. And it's hard because if you don't have that mindset, you do take offense to all this stuff. But 90% of these people you meet in the real world, they don't act like that. And it's so yeah. weird how this is changing society with these these echo chambers that we create. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I mean, I get way more positive feedback, way more than I do, you know, the negative yeah. stuff. Of course. You know, every every once in a while, you're going to get this one guy who yeah. tells you, you know, I'm fat. And I'm like, <laughs> Man, I didn't know it. My mom's mm -hmm. always told me I was big boned. <laughs> John, <laughs> like, uh, Mr. Dalton know. of uh, Creek Fishing Adventures, I had him on the show. I think it was the first couple of months I had this thing. And, and he said, what's so funny, the person that complains the most, he also is the first one probably to see the video when it drops. And he watches it all the way through for errors. And then <laughs> yeah. he comments. Yeah. And I don't know, when he said that, it just put some of this stuff in perspective, like, you get popular enough to where you have people that want to do that. If that yeah, makes any sense. Know, I don't remember if it was Gary V or somebody once you, when you're doing everything right, mm -hmm. there's always going to be those people that hate that. And that's fine. They, they may not like the format of my channel. Uh, you know, they may not like me and that's fine. I mean, the, you know, I'm still going to go out there and grind every day and put the work in because I say this was a dream I never wanted. <laughs> uh, you know, I, the only reason that I really got into fully doing it was because, you know, me and you were talking before and, you know, both YouTube and fishing, there's a lot of similarities because I don't really have never had, you know, my dad didn't fish my, my, my papa fished, but, he was, you know, just crappie and white bass. And, you know, I didn't really get to fish with him, you know, so the whole bass fishing thing is something that I just learned. Like, you know, I didn't have anybody around me that had a bass boat or had or tournament fished or, you know, any of that. And all that stuff that I've went out and done, I've learned myself. And now like you see me fishing a lot by myself and it's, a lot of it is because <clears throat> a lot of guys that are good at tournament fishing, they don't want to fish with me because they don't want to take the chance that three years from now I'm out there and show a spot that, that they fish all the time. It, that is weird. Cause I feel like that too. Sometimes now that I, I again, whatever I have where people are afraid I'm going to blow things up when I just want to, I, I don't know. It's like, and I was kind of like, I was basically a teacher. I mean, I was a coach, but I was a teacher. So yeah. I enjoy teaching. I don't like, and I don't want to say clickbaiting, but I'm just going to use that because I can't yeah. think of any other thing. I just enjoy teaching stuff. And when I have a spot and I think we can have a whole philosophical debate versus an area versus a spot. Cause if I tell yeah. you, catch them in Matta woman, which is a big Creek on the Potomac. That's yeah. a big ass area. I helped yes. narrow it down, but I didn't give you the waypoint of the grass. Club. Yeah. Yes, y exactly. Y you know, and, and it is interesting how, how, and I'd like to hit on that too. Like as it became a thing on YouTube, how did you evolve with, you got a boat, you got to get out there and get more content and that whole thing. Well, you know, we, we started seeing the channel take off and then you just start noticing little things, you know, like, like I did it just to help the guys like me, like the mm -hmm. guys that don't have anybody else. And let's face it, you know, tournament fishing is a very click sort of oriented thing. Yeah. Like the guys that are the best, are going to talk to the guys that are really good in your area. And that's me. Like I don't travel. I fish, I call them the core four lakes in my area. And that's every single year, every big regional tournaments, whether it be the BFL, the Morristown Marine or whatever, they're fishing these same four lakes. So what are the, core you know, four? so they're, they're Cherokee, uh, South Douglas. Holston, Douglas, and Norris. And sometimes they'll throw in Watts Bar, Chickamauga, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I'm there, you know, you're there every single year. 
And so, you know, when I was learning how to Domeki rig and I was getting good at it and it was early on, you know, like maybe the first or second year, you know, I did a video where I just wrecked them. You can't even go back to those spots now because those bass are there, but I mean, they will not bite a, a Domeki of any sort, kind or fashion. And I had guys literally send me pictures and, and that's okay. Look, I want guys to go catch fish. I'm not, I don't mean this in any bad way, but you know, you've got guys that are like, Hey man, we won our club tournament on that point number three down there in your video. We really appreciate you. And you know, that's good. I'm happy, but you know, I didn't get those spots. I went out there and worked and graphed and learned and got good at, at doing that. And when you see that and you put that work in, it's, it goes back, and I hate to bring this up, but it goes back to kind of how a lot of the guys are feeling about forward-facing sonar now. You know, uh, it, it maybe is a shortcut to doing certain things. And, you know, as opposed to where we did all this work. I get it. I, you know, I get that feeling, you know, I, I watched some stuff on, uh, what's her name? Caitlin Clark, the basketball player and how there's some resentment in the WNBA because this girl's doing all this and all these, you know, is on the back of them. It's kind of the same sort of deal, but you it know, is, yeah. it, it's, it's so funny. Cause I had a, um, I, I had, a, I don't want to disclose his, his name because he probably doesn't want to be mentioned, but he was complaining about YouTubers. Like, well, who who's your favorite TV star you like to listen to? And he's like, Han, Hank Parker. And he said, so if Hank Parker shot a TV show on Kerr <clears> Reservoir <throat> with a lizard Carolina rigging on a point, you don't have a qualm with it. But if a kid on YouTube does the exact same thing, he's spot burning. <laughs> Why? Because yeah. YouTube is the TV for this day and age. It just is. It is. But it's so weird. If Bill Dance does it, it's no problem. Yeah, and as one of my friends said uh, to me, uh, YouTube is obviously the deal the NFL thinks so. And let's yeah. face it, that's the biggest, you know, I mean, they might as well have a, you know, printer to print their money. And they're, they're, where do you go to watch uh, Sun NFL Sunday Ticket now? YouTube. Mm -hmm. So No, I, dude, I 100% agree with you there. <clears throat> it's... No, it's fascinating to see how this evolves and, and really to see like your journey from football to the film room to putting it up on YouTube and then it becomes this thing. And then nowadays when you have a boat, how do you keep – it's so interesting when it becomes more of a, a job job and you got to think ahead of if you're going to do, let's say, three videos. Let's go tactical bassing Monday, Monday yeah. Wednesday, Thursday. Now, and I, again – this is why when you start doing it, even if you do it as a hobby, you appreciate the people that do this way effing more because yeah. how do you plan all that out and then get out there to fish to discover something that you think is worth talking about? It's, uh, well, you know, the how-tos are much easier to do. Like they're, you know, we can we can take a day and, and I'm lucky again, you know, we talked about this. I work a 12-hour swing shift. And I've got uh, a, a stretch of seven days off every month. But, you know, I do love tournament fishing. Like I do plan, I'm, I'm taking this year off, you know, because I'm that close to being full time, to being where I need to be full time. But I have to save every dime I can get, you know, so that I've got a little nest egg sitting there. And, you know, so I've not put out a lot of fishing videos earlier this year. And you'll get those guys and they'll start being like, hey, man, you know, wish you was doing a little more fishing, but at the same time, I've been on these core four practicing mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily want to show that stuff right now because I'm going to be back there next year or the year after. And so, yeah, there's some of it like, you know, we've got a Shad Spawn video coming out that I'm, I'm editing on. I've been editing on today. Okay. It's Shad Spawn. You know, that's, if you can find the shad, you can throw a spinner bait, you can catch fish. So you've got to be real careful about that. And then planning, we've began, we've really begun to do more and more of that over time. Like, you know, this weekend I sat down and, and planned probably the next from July videos that we're going to shoot from July on. Now we leave some gaps in there just in case some, you know, 
hot new topic comes up mm -hmm. or we go to a lake that, you know, we don't fish tournaments on, which during the summer we, we do a lot. Uh, we, we kind of come back cause I live right on the Tennessee, Virginia border. And so I, I fish Tennessee is where all your big um, tournaments are where I live, you know, and the Virginia side it's, there's like four or five lakes most of them are like electric only, no, no wake. There's one that we kind of started fishing last year and we just discovered and was like blown away with what we found on it. electric and motor. No, it's, it's a, it's a full on okay. on. And, and so, so we're, we're definitely going back to that, but they're high. They're like what I call super highlands reservoirs. Yeah, like trout. The, trout yeah, lakes. yeah. The water temps probably only yeah. reach, uh, in the middle of summer, maybe 78 degrees. Isn't that crazy that if an alien came down here and watched Bassmaster, you'd think there's only four lakes in the United States. <laughs> but you, yeah. I, I would love somebody to make a YouTube channel where they just explore. All, there's so many freaking lakes in each state that I, I know, Yeah. I, I, I've lived well, that's one of the things that I, I want to do. Like everybody wants to go to Lake Murray. Everybody wants no. to go to Chickamauga. Everybody wants to go to Gunnersville. You know, that's been done. Like this lake, this lake is untouched by, by, you know, what I've been doing, which, mm -hmm. it, and I'll tell you, it's four face sonar, but I'll, I'll also say this is a bite that I've fished for ever. And it's, during the summer in these ultra clear lakes with not a lot of cover, there's no grass, they're all steep, it's just rocks. These largemouth relate to shad in the middle. And from about the time that they move out, they'll start busting shad in the middle of summer. Soon as the shad spawns over, they'll move out and they'll just relate to these schools of shad. Almost like they do on blueback lakes. Yeah, yes. And so what ends up happening is, you know, for years, I'd take big swim baits and just fan cast in areas and catch them. And you're, you're fishing blind. Now we can see these schools of 50, 100, 250 bass out here just gorging all summer long. And we even, we even found them. We found these in July. And in August, the last week of August, like middle of August, the nights start to get short and the temperature dropped three well, we, we followed these bass for five miles down the lake, chasing these shad throughout from, from August to the end of September, 1st of October. We followed these schools for five miles as they migrated to their winter's areas. That's so cool. And, and, and live scope is what, what's taught me that, you know, like I knew it was going on. I mean, you can go back and watch, you know, you can go back and watch me catch almost 20 pounds on a, on a you know, spook a one knocker walking bait, you know, five, six years ago, but I didn't understand what was actually going on. You know, I'd seen them on the side image and suspended and I just took a walking bait and started and collared them up from 30, 40 feet. And the ultra clear yeah. water, <laughs> the amount of information you learn. And I, I, I get, it's so funny. Cause I think we are so, what's the word I'm looking for? we have so many things that people 20, 30 years ago don't have when it comes to information. Yeah. Last, last winter, I got to experiment with smallmouth on parts of the river up here where I'm at. And it was 33 degree water. Generally speaking, you're going to be doing tubes and jigs on the bottom. And I said, mm -hmm. you know what? I want to practice the Demiki rig fishing. Yes. And the ability to see that these fish <clears throat> in 33 degree water would launch off the bottom. Oh, dude. And, and it's like, but, Bass Master magazines of old would say like they wouldn't act like that in 33 degree water, but when you oh. visually see them, like and first off, if you guys don't know smallmouth, they will lock on the bottom. You won't see them for shit on forward facing, you know, until they move. But that opened my eyes to their behavior so much more. It's like God, this is cool that we can learn so quickly with this stuff. Yeah, and you know, back to what you were saying, you know, I I done a few shorts. Again, you know, I hate to. Uh, I hate to, you know, but South Holston, which is really where kind of the Demiki really started at. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody oh. gives it to, to Cherokee, but it really wasn't Cherokee. Great smallmouth like. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we're out there and we're catching them 
80 feet deep because there's, there's owl wives in that lake and the owl wives go deep. So something that I've truly learned about the difference between shad, which is like gizzard shad, threadfin shad, American shad, is that they like the sun. They'll stay high in the water column, even in the, on the coldest days. And owl wives, which is a herring, will go deep. And they're a little bit bigger. And those smallmouth like them a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so we're Domeki rigging in bass that are not over 80 foot, in 80 foot, in balls of shad, <clears throat> going so fast chasing that shad that a one-ounce head will not get down to them quick enough. Like you have to hope if they're going a direction, you're timing it right to get there mm -hmm. on, on four and six pound test line. And, you know, so, so I seen that this winter and I was like, wow, you know, those, those fish were not dormant. They were not resting. They were out there all day busting shad, schools of shad on the bottom at a hundred miles an hour. I wonder when we'll start seeing like a three or four ounce, like the saltwater tackle jig heads yeah. start entering the market. Um, I, I've said on live streams before, you always look for the next best thing. It's going to be Japan or saltwater. And yeah. there's so many things in saltwater. Like I, I blew this up is the massive tuna poppers are great on blueback lakes because yeah. they have draw power. It's just interesting to see what, what I think is going to be coming in next to the industry. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, speaking of duo, I, you know, got the duo shirt on, you know, the, uh, the BR head, and the BR fish that I talked about last year, that was actually a saltwater bait. And, you know, and what's great is, you know, it's, it, it's got a side to side walk. And I mean, I can fish it. They're half ounce. I can fish it down to 50, 55 feet. And, you know, during the summer and during the, uh, the fall, it's incredible. How do you practice with all like, not practice, but I, maybe it is you practice with different techniques to be able to like either make a video or get confident. Like I saw you do a spy bait thing, uh, two weeks ago, I think. And I've been on, I've been talking about the spy bait for way too long and, and, and no one, I kind love of, it, man. no one got onto it. And so I guess as a guy that's been a firm believer of a spy bait before it was cool, was it, you just say like, I'm going to learn these so many techniques this year and I'm going to cycle through them. Or is it just, Oh, this looks cool. You know, for me, it's, uh, uh, well, so I love catching bass. I get so bored. Like I don't really bass fish for tournaments. It's, I mean, I, I, they're fun. I'm a competitive guy, but I, the thing that I have discovered that I love about bass fishing is catching fish on something different mm -hmm. that, I mean, there is nothing in the world when I sit there and I go, nobody knows how to do this. Yeah. I mean, I just, it, it just, it just gets me going, dude. Like, I mean, I'll be like, I'll be like nobody's going to believe what I'm doing. Nobody's going to believe that I'm taking a head and spook and walking it like a glide bait over top of fish that are 35 foot deep. And then just walk, just wait for them to come up and go. Bloop. And I'm catching 20 pounds out of lakes that nobody's caught 20 pounds out of, you know, doing that. And, you know, for me, that's just, that's cool. Can I do it in a tournament? Eh, probably not. I'll probably screw it up because I'll be all nervous, <laughs> but, but you know, but that being said too, you know, I had to learn that same lake that I'm talking about, even though I didn't give the name, when I first started fishing it, I would have people come up to me on the lake or in the parking lot. And they're like, dude, I've never seen anybody fish this lake like you're fishing it. And I'd be like, thanks, man. You know, that's awesome. I'm like, I, I just think and try different things. You know, I like to do things different. Yes. And then what happened was, is now on that lake. And this is why I tell everybody, this is, this is to me, this lake and the lake that I'm talking about fishing last summer. And, and I've seen this on the ledge lakes. Uh, Kentucky lakes are bad because of all the carp, but um, Chickamauga is a great example of it. Uh, everybody's like, oh, you know, the fish ain't got nowhere to hide. They're not, they're going to get used to the boat and the bait. You know, mm -hmm. one of the last videos I pumped out was the minnow bait is dead. What's next? 
And they're going to get used to this minnow bait. They're, it's just going to happen. I even say in that video, the scene, I remember when the Cinco come out. I mean, I, I couldn't keep fish off of it. And it's still great bait and still catches them. But it didn't catch them like it did then. I remember when the Chatterbait come out. The Chatterbait's a great bait. But it, and it still catches them. But it don't catch them like it did when nobody else was throwing it. Oh, I remember when the A-Rig come out. Now, ain't nobody can argue this. The A-Rig don't catch them like it used to. Do, do you, you know? think different baits have a higher threshold of fish catching on to it? So I, I usually say, to what you just said there, they're going to catch on to a chatterbait more than a Senko because yes. the vibration that they feel with their lateral lines, they can quickly click into like, I should not touch that. Yes. Bait. Yeah. I, and I agree a hundred percent with that. You know, the, the minnow bait's always going to do well. It's going to be a little more on that Senko lines simply because you can change color so easily. But I've already talked to guys, uh, and, and that's kind of the one benefit. And I, I hate to chase rabbits off about it. I'm, I know I missed the, the question or that started me down this. No, 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 go for it. But, uh, you know, that's the great thing about getting to where I'm at now. And, and, you know, of course, I always say, and I don't want to say like I did this, I did nothing. I'm lucky enough to have the people that like to watch. And the only reason that I get to do the things that I get to do is because of them. I am a fat redneck from Southwest Virginia that just likes fishing. <laughs> That's it. That's only, there's nothing special about me. And, but, but I, I now get to talk to a lot of different bait makers. I get to talk to several different pros. Uh, and you start to hear things like, oh, well, a silver head in the eyes, or they're starting to recognize it. You know, I'm cutting the eyes off and I'm doing certain things. I'm not going to give this away, but I'm doing certain things because this is a company. They're, they're making these. Uh, you can go, I'm not affiliated with this company, but Brazalo Baits, just go look at a certain head that they've got in a certain paint job. It breaks up in clear water real well. And, you know, there's these things that, that are starting to, you know, the bass are starting to get used to it. And, and it's, it, it, is, it is easy right now. Because there's not a lot of guys that have, and I really shouldn't say have forward facing sonar, but not a lot of guys are good at it. That's the big one right there. Yeah. And and they'll get that way. It was the same way on Chickamauga. You know, everybody would everybody and their mama knows where the best spots on that ledge, on those ledges are. And they've seen every crankbait, they've seen every swim bait, they've seen every jig, every magnico, mag this, that, and the other. And they're they're more spread out than they used to be. There's not these super schools that we used to hear about, you know. And it's the same way on Pickwick now and Gunnersville and anywhere else where there's a ledge bite. Uh, or a deep water offshore bite. It's the same on South Holson, you know, South Holson, it's the same on uh Douglas, who they any have river great. reservoir, yeah, exactly, and and those those fish get used to that pressure and they spread out because they know spreading out is is going to make it harder for us to catch them. But back to a spy bait, that's how I got on a spy bait. Good friends with Ben Nowak, seen Ben using it, and then to me, I know he's using it for those smallmouth up there, but I'm thinking. And that's the key to me. I'm always thinking about how does that bait apply to one of the bites that I like to mm -hmm. fish. And I like to fish offshore. I've always been a summer angler. It's just, you know, it's when I like to be out there fishing. And I looked at that spy bait and I went, man, I catch a lot on an underspin. And I catch a lot on a swim bait. And that, bait, that bite's kind of going away. I wonder if I could get out there and catch these same ledge bass on a spy bait and you can but as i always say there's a difference between soft plastic and hard baits and hard baits whether it be a giant swim bait or whether it be a spy bait you need something to break that break it up a lot of times for me that's when i've had my most success and i think that's especially around largemouth in clear water because yes. Large mouth are, they are a lot more take their time to look at it. Where small mouth are just like, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're going to go and spots are the same way. Large mouth are like, I'm going to look at it. I don't, I don't know about it. You know, you've really got to entice them into it. 
they're like, it, it's the difference between, you know, you know, uh, a fat guy and a skinny guy, you know, a fat guy is going to, you know, we, we're going to kind of take our time about a certain job and look at it and be like, how can we do this and not get overly exerted where, you know, my best friend Mike in there, he's just going to come in, you know, wah, just do it. You know, <laughs> you mentioned something earlier that's so fascinating about, you know, you like to fish the big four. And I've always thought that fishing pressure is not fishing pressure. It's, lake pressure and it's very mm -hmm. specific to lakes where you're right you can go to places in virginia maryland probably tennessee that haven't seen a bait before and all of a sudden that bites back but yeah. you go to cherokee or gunnersville or lake bio in japan where they only have three bass in the whole damn thing yeah. and you got to get insanely sneaky and, and yeah I, I wonder if this is where things just go in in droves I, I had this existential moment in april when i was i was tying on for the potomac and it's like we now have the chatter bait the crank bait the swim jig the spinner bait the swim bait itself that's five baits i can only have one rod and in that mindset that's why everyone just throws a chatter bait on the potomac is just cuz and yeah. all of a sudden then the spinner bait will get hot again because everyone went away from it or the crank bait and yeah. i i wonder if that's the weird merry-go-round we're on now where what's old will be new again because enough time when was the last time up until recently you heard about spinnerbaits playing it went through a lull on the circuits where it, it wasn't playing a long time and you know i mean that's one of the trends that i've seen in videos have been tubes yeah you know tubes are and, hot. and and people comparing neds and tubes right now so maybe a little more of finesse tube you know and uh <laughs> yes and not to toot my own horn but two years ago i did that video <laughs> so as a guy so being in the dmv we have the new river the james river the shenandoah the upper potomac the parts of the roanoke the susquehanna juliet so we got so many river rats and the greatest question to ask every all of them is are you a tube guy are you a Ned Rig guy? Because guess what? It is saying, are you a Cowboys fan or a Redskin? Because yeah, if you yeah. like the tube, you don't throw the Ned Rig. And it's fascinating the cultish tribalism between those two baits. Well, they would probably all have hated that video that I did because it was a <laughs> it was a finesse tube, and I took a Ned head and put down inside of it and poked Ooh. through and was like, look at this. <laughs> There's some of my river rats right there. Tubes all day. Yep. yep. Tubes all day. It, but you're right. It, it's so fascinating. Like people, and that's the other thing too, is like, like you said about the forward facing center, people aren't good at it. Some people are just stuck in their ways. I, I know some yeah. guys and then and Bassmasters that I'm with, they will throw a tube between now and the end of time. They don't yeah. care. And you get that one person that just thinks outside the box a little bit and they think it's witchcraft. Yeah. Like, and I don't know that that whole dance we do with the fish and the pressure is so I am fascinating with because I don't know how much of it is. It's just the new bait or it's just a new look. And so yeah. and it gets back to what you said. What's old is new again. Well, you know, and that's really, like I said, the difference between I call them top secret like P and F and P. I grew up fishing. It was one of the three small lakes on Virginia that I grew up fishing. It's a no way lake. It's really like a creek arm. On a Were major you, did you grow up a Virginia boy or Tennessee? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm in Virginia, man. I'm right oh, on the dumb. line. Yeah, okay. yeah I'm, I'm a Virginia boy. Um, but uh, that lake now, now that all the people who are locals are like, oh, you know, yeah, I know this. And, you know, Tommy watches my videos and Tommy tells Billy and Billy tells, you know, Jimmy and Jimmy tells uh, Jody and Jody tells Stephen and so the down the line these guys don't even know so you know last year i went up there and there was nobody in the parking lot and i'm out there just clocking them on top water and uh, minnow baits two weeks after those videos come out i couldn't even get on the the four or five spots on that lake like you, it was a race to them. and then i come back a little bit later and the bass were so spread out they were there but they were so spread out i mean they wouldn't hit anything they had been beat up so bad, you know, and that's when, when I seen that, I was like, we got to go somewhere else, you know? So that's why I started going to top secret Lake F. And, you know, for me, I, I don't want to go up there. Like last year, we went up there and we really dialed it in, but now I've kind of learned, I know I'm not going to fish tournaments on that lake. So I'm going to go up there and get all the fun out of every fish I can get. 
because I know if I don't, like I already had a guy call me and, you know, dude, it is incredible what you're doing on that lake. I've never seen anything like it. And I've fished it my whole life. And so how many people do you think he's told at this uh, point? You mentioned Lake, I'm dyslexic, whatever the first one is. That P. The, the P. P. They used to be on spots A, B, C, and then they yeah. were dispersed all over the lake. Was that something that you noticed over a day, a week, a year that that transition happened? It was. Or... It was last year. Like it was really quick. Like wow. You know, we we went and they were on, and probably you know because that bite that summer bite tends to last, you know, well into like I said, you know, it'll start in late June, July, last through the end of August. And, uh, you know, we went back and, uh, I mean, they, they wouldn't touch a minnow. They wouldn't touch a top water. Uh, they wouldn't touch anything because they'd just been hounded on. And then all of a sudden I pull out the BR fish and just whack some great fish on it. And that, that to me, that was like, here we go. You know, we've got this different action. We've got this different bait and, uh, you know, they're, they're reacting to it. They've seen all these others. And that's what's important is it doesn't mean the lake is dead. I've, I don't know. Yes. We've all been to the boat ramp where they said like, well, this lake sucks now, but it's like, no, like they're still there and they'll eat. You just have to show them something different. You have to. And that's, that's why I love fishing. It's why I'm such a horrible tournament angler <laughs> is because like in practice, I've got 20 rods and I'm like, well, if I bought this, let me see if I can try this, these other 30 baits. And that's, that's what I like to do. But you can't do that in tournament fishing. You know, you, you were like, I'm so excited about going up here because I know I'm going to catch these bass. And I know I can go up there and catch them on two, three baits. And I can just sit there and catch 20, 30 a day. But I want to go up here and I want to catch me four or five and get enough for, for a fishing video. And then I'm going to start rambling baits, man. Like my boat won't get on plane. I'll have so many baits in it because I want to be like, well, I wonder if they'll react to this or I wonder if they react to that. Here's this bait. Here's that bait. Let me try this. Hey, I wonder if I just throw a square bill in there and just work it erratically. Like they'll, they'll bite it. That's how my mom, my mind thinks. So, and so for everybody in chat, you know, before we get into like our, our top baits, I have some stuff here I'll pull out. I'll hit the smallmouth river angle since we're around that so much stuff. And you can ask your questions. One thing that popped into my head I had to ask you, I've had this where I've talked to guests about this specific question. I would like to get your thoughts on it. To be Because you want to try to be a tournament angler. T to be a tournament angler, do you have to be good at fishing or just good at fishing that lake? Because if you look like at the Bass Opens where they used to go to the James River for 15 years in a row – all you had to do was place there and get lucky up at Champlain or something. And yeah. congratulations, you're in like with yeah. your four lakes that you've talked about where, yeah, let's say you get really good at those. Does it really matter if you suck in North Carolina, South Carolina, if you can just always punch a ticket there? Yeah. To me, to me, a good angler and, and I won't even say a good tournament angler. I, I guess probably a good tournament angler. You got to be able to go anywhere and catch fish. And, and, and you know what I love about the high school and college about this influx of youth is used to, there used to be a guys that could, you know, fish a Ned rig. They wouldn't want us reaching for a jig, <laughs> you know, and, and you would win tournaments. You better be pretty good at a lot of different things now to be able to go and catch fish consistently and compete for what I think, look, the Bassmaster Classic's great, the Red Crest is great, but the best angler in the world is the AOI, period. Yes, I agree. They're the best. Yep. We don't give that enough nope. as fans. Uh, that means you've done it all year, everywhere. Now, you can, if you want to be a local stick, and that's all I really want. I just want to go out here and beat some of these local guys who are real good. That's all I want to do. If I ever... <laughs> Yeah. Get to compete at the Toyota or the open level, so be it. But right now, my goal is I just want to go out there and say, you know, I'm not just a YouTuber. I can go take your money tomorrow. It's fine. You know. What do you mean by, like, I've had other YouTubers <laughs> on, like, oh, I'm just a YouTuber. It's like, well, I don't know. Like, when did that get a negative connotation like that, that, oh, you can't catch fish. You're just a content creator. Well, you know. 
I think, gosh, I don't want to say a lot of this, but I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> There's, look, I'm not the greatest angler in the world. And I'll be the first to tell you that. I'll, I'll tell anybody that I'm not a pro. I do not, I do not inspire to be a pro. I do things and I talk about things because that's what I like to do. I like to go out and learn to catch fish on different things. Uh, but there is competition in the industry. There's not a lot of sponsors. Spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, listen, I love my pros and I've got friends that are pros and I don't mean anything to them, but most of them don't, don't sell baits. They don't, they don't get views. They only, you know, they, they think fishing is where it's at and that's I get it. And it should be, to. it should be. It should be where it's at. And that's more of a reflection mm. on the leagues, in my opinion, than it is on the, the state of bass fishing. But, you know, and, and people can go, uh, you know, and I've had it. I've had it. I always say this, too. If I go to, if I go and I pick up a Rapala jerkbait and I go out and I catch a bunch of fish, whether I like it or not, people are going to go buy that bait. Whether I'm, prom I'm not promoting it, I'm not sponsored by them, I don't have anything with it. And, you know, so looking at it from that perspective, because I use everything. I know that people do not watch my channel for me to say, hey, I use only this, I use only this, and I use only yeah. this. I'm not a pro. I'm just a guy who fishes. But yeah. You, yeah. If I want to get to where I want to be, which also gives you freedom to do a lot more as you grow, because let's face it, in this country, money is freedom, right? It is. Well, unless you just want to go live in a small cabin in the woods, it, it money is freedom. And, you know, so I have to have sponsors to get from point A to point B. And that means I'm in direct competition with professional anglers. It, and so I think that's, yeah. that's hmm. where the kind of the thing comes in. And I've even got local guys who they'll, they'll get mad at me because, you know, I've, I've heard it. I've had friends. It's, there's one guy and he's like, Oh, you know, I don't understand how he gets all this stuff. You know, he don't fish tournaments. Well, no, I don't. But neither do you know, TV show hosts. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I usually I can already picture the demographic that's saying this stuff too. I mean, they were probably alive, you know, during Vietnam. President Carter was around, and and, and again, and it's just fascinating to me because like I'll I have every YouTuber, content creator, person like that, a person that has a big public per, per forward facing persona, uh, persona. Thank you, I can speak English. They're the nicest people ever. I've read into professionals yeah. where they were professional football players, baseball yeah. players, and anglers, and I've had bad experiences with all three. I have never had a bad one with a YouTuber. And right there alone, it's just so interesting where these people are so much better at teaching and entertaining than the pros in their sport. And it's an obvious thing that's right there in front of you of what you need to do. And it's this weird refusal not to do it. That's what blows my mind. Well, and, and I'll be honest with you. Like, I've never had a bad experience with a pro. I have, like, the guys, but I'm a fanboy, you mm -hmm. know. So I'm I'm not afraid to, to humble myself when I approach KVD or, you know, whoever. I, I'm a fanboy. I, I love professional bass fishing. I wished I was better at tournament fishing. I plan on getting better at it. Uh, but I'm also 50, so don't think I'm probably going to be on the road out there a lot. <laughs> You know, doing that sort of thing. But, you know, that's just the business side of it, man. And, you know, I mean, I always say, you know, I got my teeth kicked in. I went out. I'll never forget. We had this conversation last time. I got my teeth kicked in on uh, the uh, Mountain Division BFLs. And, you know, I'd, I'd had probably six months with my live scope, but I did not understand what these guys were doing with it at the time. And 
they just beat me down with it. They were incredible. And so I, I've spent the past 12 months just learning. I said, I will not catch another fish until I see it on live scope. Unless I see, see it on live scope and I will figure out how to catch them from shallow to deep doing it. And that's been my goal this year. And, you know, I've also wanted to figure out, you know, a lot of the other lakes doing that. Because I know I can traditional fish, okay? I've done that my whole life. I've fished for 40 years. I know I can pick up a jig and go flip. You know, this is new technology. That's why I don't really have a lot of sympathy for the older guys who are whining. Just do it, man. Knock you that crap. Go just do it. Put in the time. Don't tell me I got a family and I can't do this and I can't do that. This is interesting. You know? <laughs> okay, so Brandon Brandon has an interesting thing here to go with this. To get good at pro fishing, uh, all you need is money to stay alive during the bad times. That is, Brandon, I don't believe that 100%, but I do agree compared to, let's say, football or baseball where you could just be, you could just be God gifted and you're going to find a way. Yeah. If I gave anybody with a skill set in fishing a blank credit card that you could put an unlimited amount there and you could fish the opens every year for 10 years how many would actually make the tour and i think that's very disheartening in one sense to where that is a big freaking barrier to entry it's just you just need the money to hang in there and learn it listen there's a lot of guys i know and who i'm friends with who are great on douglas they don't do real well on South Holston. They don't do real well on Cherokee or they don't do real well on Norris. There's guys I know that are great on Watts Bar, but they don't do well, you know, here and there. And you've got to put time on the water. And that really is, that really is. Now there is a certain skill and the, you know, gifted guys, Kevin Van Dam, Jacob Wheeler, Aaron Martins, yeah. Aaron Martins, those guys are special and uh you know but time on the water matters and that's one of the things that's one of the things like i want to get to like before i die mm -hmm. i just want to be able to fish like three four you know five days a week i just want to see how good i can get before i die <laughs> i think it also means you got to fish different bodies of water because this is something somebody told me off record was one thing that gave a lot of drama with MLF is they were going to so many different bodies of water in the rules. It affected the guys that got good at fishing Lake Hartwell every April, same yeah. time of year for 30 yeah. years. And you could receive that in the schedule. And when he said some of those things, it clicked to me. I was like, oh, okay, that's why there's power at being a veteran is because you have gone to the same yes. places the same time yes. all these years. Yes. You know, those spots, you know, yeah. you know, those areas it's, it wouldn't be any different from me going to top secret lake p or f or you know south holston you know which is or, or you know well cherokee's kind of changed on me over the years i remember when you could go when it was a, a largemouth lake like you'd go down and deep crank and you know back when the hot lips and all that stuff and you know now you don't go down past german creek unless you're looking for a smallmouth so it just just don't exist anymore that would be a fun episode. I definitely want to get a biologist to talk about Cherokee and that evolution because you hear about lakes going from largemouth to spot or something to spot, but you never from largemouth to smallmouth usually. That just seems really unique. Well, a lot of it's got to do, I think, with how much it cleared up. Like Cherokee was yeah. always a, a, a stained lake. There was a power plant above it where, uh, oh my gosh, the guy in the tin boat i cannot believe i forgot his name it's an awesome dude i love you mean ought to foe no not ought uh the one that there? was john in cox the mlf no it wasn't john keith poche louisiana poche yeah <laughs> just keep going yeah, <laughs> yeah just lead us. <laughs> oh but uh you know he was actually below that's called a severe dam and that, that's actually was used to be okay. a, a power plant i think that and then there was a couple other things I've heard zebra mussels, but I've never seen them in there. And, you know, smallmouth will outcompete largemouth in clear bodies of water. They're just more aggressive. You know, it's kind of the same thing you were talking about with the uh, Alabama spots. Is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, they just will outcompete. And that's that's the problem. 
That'd be interesting zebra mussels to get in there because I, I had John Hudekirk on who is a big darling of the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources and, and I pinned him on one show talked to him about are all invasives created equal and he's like no I mean you know they're not because he said like zebra mussels look what they did up at the Great Lakes and you know on one hand they caused tons of damage because of how how uh, their ability to just completely cover the bottom and they'll get into drainages yeah. and stuff but it's also made the water that much cleaner. It's the cleanest the, the Great Lakes have been in like 30, 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. And then you look at the gobies, like, yeah, they outcompeted the crayfish, but they created an industry with the walleye and the smallmouth. So yeah. it, it's not all created equal. So it is something I want to get back to because then you have like the carp on poor Kentucky Lake. So oh, yeah. don't, I know my show usually gets into all that nerdy stuff, but. Um, but now look at what it's done for the smallmouth on that. Lake. Yeah. And then Douglas, anybody that's listening that's fishing Douglas, I got bad news for you. I've been saying this for probably three years. There's bigger smallmouth being caught on Douglas the past three years, and the largemouth population is getting smaller and declining. It was nothing to go there during the summer and catch a 25-pound bag offshore of largemouth. Mm -hmm. That don't exist anymore. Unless you got a lot of blueback or, or trout largemouth do not like clear rocky reservoirs they no. just don't um or you could put sav in there but most yeah. southern places hate hydrilla with the stain yeah yes and 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 being that you know that's a uh tva lake system they don't care about that that's not why those lakes were built they've specifically said that and tva is never going to do anything you know for that so and, and plus they raise it, you know, uh, you know, I think they lower Douglas like 35, 40 feet. So the grass isn't ever going to really take there. Yeah. That'll be fun to follow. Um, yeah, that's a bucket list item. So I want to get somebody down from Tennessee to talk about the SAV situation because um, spoiler for my conversation here, Alabama bass have never based on the data from the guy at Clemson, it's going to come out. We have never gotten into Gunnersville or Florida, and they hypothesize it's because aquatic vegetation. Hmm. It prohibits spotted bass from gaining a massive foothold, hmm. yet they want to get rid of it. So how will that affect those lakes when the Ooh. grass goes away? Um, wow. But I want to get somebody else to kind of counter his argument at some point, because I think that's fascinating, where maybe if we want to bring back large mountain in some lakes, we got to let hydrilla and other things grow to give them yeah. a competitive advantage. And my honest opinion is TVA doesn't want, I, I think these rocky lakes up here, I think they want them to be the small mouth section, you know, along with Del Hollow. And yeah. I think that's, they, they prefer these lakes to be all small mouth, which makes me sad because yeah. I love, you know, I love to go with small. Well, large mouth are so much easier to catch during the summer <laughs> in the mm -hmm. South. You know, so much easier to catch during the summer in the South, you know. Well, well, speaking of summertime, I guess this is a great little segue. Everyone listening right now, thank you guys. I think we have, let me see, because Instagram does not work with StreamYards for some stupid reason. We've got 10 people, I think, on Instagram, plus everybody else here on Facebook and YouTube. So for this part of the show here, I'm going to pull out my tackle box. I'm going to show a few baits off, and we'll just talk baits real quick and get all your questions answered. As always with Monday Night Live, the best questions will win a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. So get your questions in the uh, in the old comment box. Let me grab some stuff here. Oh, here we go. So we're talking about off the show. I can't wait until I can have my studio next to my boat so I don't have to pull <laughs> tons of crap out and walk it down a staircase. I thought, which would be kind of cool, is since I have so many smallmouth rivers, shallow rivers, I can hit that pretty good. Some of my fun stuff here. Oh, cool. So while he's looking, I'm going to reply to Dave Smith. He said, uh, are you going to ICAST this year? I'm not. Maybe that's to you, sir. But so I'm not. I, yeah. Uh, I hate oh. that I'm gonna miss it, but you know I'm I'm gonna miss it this year. I'm gonna probably miss it this year. We need to get a new vehicle, and that's how it is since my sponsors can't pay my way this year. So that's just what it sadly is gonna be. But I will probably be still live streaming it, uh, where I will send down my equipment, and they will beam it to us, and we'll make sure we can still have coverage. That's cool. Um, let me see. So let's see. I got a bait here. I'll start with. So number one, if you're for smallmouth, uh, Susquehanna river, Shenandoah, places like that is a finesse swim jig. We are going to be, if you can tell the head on this thing has actually just been worn the paint off. Of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, yeah. Look, dude, you see, there's still a little on the top. <laughs> it, 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 
I don't know what, and this is the, what really clicked with me with with a swim jig is it's basically a, a skirted swim bait. Yeah. And if you start fishing it like that, it just absolutely changes how you approach the cast, the the technique, and how you work that thing through there. I like a, I like a little rage bug on the end, and damn it, if this doesn't look like a little minnow, and it absolutely yeah. smokes it this time of year, uh, especially as the grass gets up on a lot of the, the rivers up near us. So now do you find with a swim jig, cause a swim jig for me is like a spring post spawn bite, you know, when the, when the shad spawns going on and it's something that I'm going to throw around docks and lay downs and that sort of stuff. So do you find that a swim jig, you still need some sort of cover grass? We're going to get all, we're going to get in the autism spectrum with this. So <laughs> I think with what a swim jig is, it's, it can be super duper finessey. And I think the number one thing a swim jig has always mimicked are bluegill and crappie because mm. the lakes I fished growing up did not have a shad in them and I could catch them on this white fleck. Yeah. But I started to snag these big crappie in these brush piles I was fishing and the mm. light bulb went off. It's like, oh, it's not just the white that's for shad. Yeah. Yeah. I think when the shad bite goes on, it's something that's so instinctual for Southern anglers to do. And this works so great being weedless to bust through there. But when the bluegill bite is on, I can fish this thing around nothing, but it has to be an insanely light head to where a bluegill will pause. A bluegill is not afraid of a bass necessarily like a shad is. And I think yeah. you have to mimic that very slow methodical movement and you can stop it to make it plume and pulse and hit mm -hmm. things. And so when I throw a swim jig for, for bluegill, I need the lightest head I can possibly get away with. So if I hit a stick, that thing will just almost pause for a second before it flutters down so I can get that reaction. For me, I've almost pushed jigs the entire group, whether they're, you know, I'm dragging them. But, and again, now when I say I fish clear water, like during the, during the summer, you can be in areas where it's, 20 and 35 foot that you can see mm -hmm. uh, most time we'll say 12 to 15 feet visibility right so i've almost even pushed jigs to the hard bait section interesting to where, to where if it's slick to where it's sunny i'm going to pick up a soft plastic you know i'm going to pick up a rage bug only and flip it or texas rig a worm or i won't i won't even touch a jig like I might do it first thing in the morning, uh, you know, as we got some low sun or if we get some ripple on the water, but I've almost pushed them in those conditions that I fish a lot during the summer exclusively to, to needing some sort of light breakup. And are we talking what depth and what, what's the situation now, ledges on Kentucky or like the grass in the back of a pocket? I, I'm talking Highlands reservoirs. Okay. You know, that's, that's where I'm fishing at most of the time. Now, like you said, like some lake, like Kentucky, that's, you know, if you got dirty water, you know, and what I consider dirty water, yeah. <laughs> you know, anything under three foot, but, uh, you know, you got two foot, one foot, two foot. Yeah, man, a jig's going to work all day. I'm good with it. But once we start getting above that three foot visibility, especially five, uh, that's when I've kind of relegated it to low light or, you know, choppy water conditions or a lot of um, cover, you know. Would that be also a chatterbait then in that same, same yes, idea? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes, I don't. I don't even touch it now. Now during the summer on Douglas, and the reason why I brought up Douglas earlier too is because the water is also clearing on that lake. It's getting. Yeah, I swear it's clear every single year. And uh, on Douglas, I've thrown some of the Magnum chatter baits. Like when it, uh, that deep bite gets gets tough on, you know, spoons and swim baits. Uh, uh, Picasso makes one. I think they make one that's all the way up to like an ounce and a half. Yeah. So you can fish it to down down to like forty, and you put like a, a big jerky J on that or uh, something like that, and it's you know you just kind of rip it off the bottom and let it sit. It's uh, it, it's something that they haven't seen a lot of, and I still don't know that guys are doing it a lot. No, it's probably um, taxing. It's like those super duper deep crankbaits back in the day where like you had to yeah. burn a thousand calories to even work <laughs> yeah. the thing. Um, let's see where's the other thing. So, and then we're gonna go to the other end of the spectrum because it's getting to be that time of year where the, the bigger bite's gonna go away. 
Uh, mm -hmm. you, you all hate this, but I love it. This is the micro TRD. Um, I throw this. That is crazy. I throw this on an uh, almost an eight eight foot uh, medium light uh, spinning rod outfit with four to six pound test, you know, leader to I think it's 12 pound sunline braid. I throw it on for some reason they will key in on that super little thing. And I'm pretty sure it's because of different larvae hatches that happen in the summertime. Mm, I can um, see that. And smallmouth again, you can catch elephants on peanuts. I don't know why I cashed all of our Thursday nighters on the smallmouth river. We fish. I was cashing checks, throwing this stupid little thing, and people were throwing full size tubes. Now, could it be just the pressure and everyone was throwing that? It's different, yes, but it it didn't make sense that they didn't have it in their lips; it was down their throat. And so that, to me, was like there's got to be some kind of hatch that they're keying in on that I don't know about. Now, I will say this about smallmouth: I don't know what it is during the summertime, but even on South Holston, one of the things that we do is we throw finesse, teeny tiny jigs, and you know, 20, 30, 40 foot of water. Like you can't even feel it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ridiculous. But for whatever reason, those smallmouth is, if they feel that heavy weight in the summertime, they'll, yes. they'll, they'll just drop it. They'll pick it and they'll just drop it immediately. I don't, because I got, and they get a little finny, a little more finicky, I think, in the summer. Yeah, and this is a uh, comparison. This is which one is this? This is the boss head. This is the boss head jig I use from nine nine rigs. This is a power. This is my spring wintertime setup. It's a heavier head for heavier current where it's gonna sit in that hole in that eddy and it's not gonna get blown down. And I can go to yeah. a, like a full half ounce. But just to compare, like the summer the, the summertime to wintertime difference there. Um, and again, everyone's like, well, that sounds super Nico too, man. It this is thing, super. I dude. love them. And what's crazy with this, and this is the difference, I think, and again, I think these are just generic situations. It'll differ depending on what situation you're at on the water. Yeah. With this being so light, when you pick it up, it will flutter down the current a lot more. And I think that looks way more freaking natural. I only go this heavy mm -hmm. when the current is so asinine where I want the weight to help me feel a bite detection of a thud yeah. or something else like that. So just keep that in mind right there. And that's something I, I'm going to pick some of those up just simply because like, the lakes that I do fish, like you can pull up on a point, and there'll be a ton of fish there. But mm -hmm. good luck getting on the bite, you know. And that's that's kind of that's what I always tell people, you know, why I like live scope so much. These fish out here ha have no pressure. These fish up here have been fished for for how road that lake is. You know, they they they're used to seeing all that pressure. Every person that's gone by has went, man, that point looks good. <laughs> And it's funny, I was, uh, there was a, we had a kayak show that we helped put on this year and I got to talk to a lot of fun smallmouth anglers. And the fun thing we talked about is like how BFS fishing has changed creek fishing and smallmouth mm, because wow. all of a sudden you can get a walking bait that's this big, crank yeah. baits, all these different baits have been downsized, which you would think of that just for maybe like a Cherokee or a place down there you want to get super pressured, but there's these yeah. other niches that that will just kill in. Yeah. That's one thing I haven't got totally into because in this clear water, they go so deep. Mm. Like, you know, I'd have to stuff something full of lead or tungsten. Yeah. And then for how fish, how deep you're fishing. I mean, that's, do you ever fish shallow this time of year? No. I mean, you can, you can literally most times see, I mean, and it depends on what you consider shallow. Like to me, shallow is anything under 10 feet. That's pretty much year round, you know? I, t I brought a buddy of mine, Joey, up from uh, – he fishes, like, all those South Carolina lakes, Hartwell and all those. And he was like, you ever throw a square bill? I'm like, yeah, I will, like, during the spring when the water's coming up and it dirties. I said, but most of the time, a square bill to me is the closest thing to a square bill I throw. It, well, at the same time, I throw a chatterbait, too. And I said, most time, a square bill to me is, like, a DT-10. <laughs> So that's wow. because, and he, he got up there and, you know, I told him, I said, listen, the lakes are like this. I was like, I always get, you know, make the joke that the, I used to read when I was first learning how to winter fish, I used to read in Bassmaster all the time. Hey, you want to look for those 45 degree? And I'm like, so not the 90, like I'm not fishing the bluff walls. Like I'm just fishing the 45s. I'm like, you know, I mean, cause that's all we've got. It's either this or this. And, you know, so, uh, 
so, you know, for me, when you're against the bank, I mean, you're 10 foot deep, <laughs> you know, you're rubbing the paint off the side of the boat. So it's, you know, what would your three go-to lures then be this time of year for that specific depth range? For that depth range, I mean, I'm going to always go with a finesse worm, Texas rig. Uh, I like to throw swim baits, man. You know, swim baits for me are, there's just in that clear water. Because there's so many people, as my buddy calls it, dink a link and a little worm around. But you throw a five or six inch. And I, I mean, I'm very specific. Like I'm not like I love a Shadowlicious and a Bastrix, but they have so much wobble to them in clear water. They're not Glad super you mentioned natural. Bastrix. I haven't heard that name in a while. Yeah. But but like I've got a buddy, uh, who, Ramsey's, who makes, you know, like these. And this isn't a promo. This is a local guy. I'm not sponsored by him. But he makes a, a swim bait. And the difference, it's like having the difference in a deep diving crankbait is it's it's flat sided. So this bait, although, you know, it has some great action, it's a much tighter wiggle, much tighter wobble. And, you know, it's uh, people used to laugh at me because I'd look at them and I'd be like, I don't fish a, I don't fish a Kitek in the summer for largemouth, but, you know, because it's too, the tail's got too much wobble. That's a, just a local a, guy here does that too. It's yeah. got that nice flat side on top, yes. tight, but it's got that good tail. Yes. And, you know, if you think about it during the summertime, even when you're around bluegill, you know, you're talking about bluegill. If you throw a pebble in around bluegill, what do they do? They swim so tight and so fast mm -hmm. that, it, that it's a body wiggle. Where during the winter time, you know, any fish, they've got that little wider tail movement and i think it's also the vibration that's put off too it's a little bit of a or b or, or yeah. you know, i guess chicken or the egg but yeah the vibration that's coming off the fish is different and i think that's what the japanese with with all the minnow crap and now yes. you know some of these new techniques coming out there you're trying to mimic what the spy bait did first which is that tight shimmy motion yes. that you get yeah and it's a uh, well you know i don't want to give it away but one of the things that i stumbled onto last year was uh the like I'd, I'd used it before with success but the uh mega bass okashira uh screw head that's what i was about to talk about <laughs> yeah <laughs> now what i love about that thing is that and i tell people all the time it's about the blade you got one clover leaf side you got one elongated side and it's the action that it gives that bait but they don't they only make it to an eighth ounce i know it's just it's, it's freaking stupid like but, and, and on the package it says it goes up to three eighths like that's yes. what i don't understand yes. for the people at home if you don't let me see if i pull it up there um it, it goes up to a, th a three eighths five, five like that would be perfect i wish somebody would I, I i don't condone this but if you're a local manufacturer or a person in your garage if you could make some heads for me that are a little bit bigger i would be greatly appreciative destroyer bait fine i i did when when i caught them in the fall on that bait and you if you're a forward-facing sonar guy let me tell you this if they are inside if you see i call it the bass bubble if you see the shad and they are inside it there is nothing better than that nothing better than that drop it down throw past the ball of shad get it down to that level and reel it through I will guarantee if you, if it don't work for you and you don't like them, call me. I'll buy them off of you. I don't care because yeah. I the, nothing better. They've seen all the, everything else, all the minnow baits. I don't know what it is about that that stands out. But I, when I discovered this last year, I did a frantic search to find and and a guy named Destroyer Baits. You, he's only got a Facebook thing, but he makes them. And I think what's so interesting in the way I've described this, it's basically a weedless spy bait um the action mm, yep. and i think that should key in people about the bait that you select everyone i've seen likes to always throw a big old paddle tail on the end of this and as a purist i feel like they made this head for a reason so yep. it's the thing that imparts the action and what you want to do is go find a bait that is not going to take away from what the head will actually get yes. you now i will throw a paddle tail during yeah. the summer 
And the reason why is because I want any extra action, especially coming through those balls of shad that I can get. Now, I don't like the swing fats or the, the swing impacts. I prefer like the the minnow, uh, what do they call them? I always want to call them the easy, easy shiner. Easy shiner. Yeah. They're, 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 they've got a soft tail, but it's a much tighter action. Uh, the one that I've really been enjoying here lately is the uh, Exxon uh, Swammer. I figured out a thing where Berkeley gulp minnows. Yeah. Because dude. I don't. Yeah, I know. I, I hope it's I'm so. Not no, things. no, <laughs> no. Uh, that's actually been a big thing. We called it tight lining. And I called that the poor man's or uh, 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 float and fly. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, what how we would fish a float and fly is we'd have like a, man, a 10, 12 foot rod, a, a bobber. We'd set it to a certain 10, 15 feet. We'd go down those those banks. We'd You'd have to load it by hitting it in the water behind you, throw it, then it hits. And then that bobber and that, that fly or that gulp minnow just pendulums down that bank and that's how you get bit now we we started using those goat goat minnows and we would just take light line three four five six pound test interesting and you just go down there and you just shake it like this and reel and the the deal is as you say i always say if it's touching the bottom continuously you're reeling a little too slow if it's never touching the bottom you're reeling a little too fast and so you want it to kind of tick every once in a while, but you just want that little minnow just to contour that bank yep. and come all the way back to you. That works good. And then putting it on this head, I, yes. I didn't realize this until forward facing sonar. And again, I was dealing with smallmouth when they would shark and not commit. I don't know if it's the scent or whatever the hell it is about it, but when they would shark on a paddle tail on this and yes. not hit it, as soon as I switched to a gulp minnow on the back of this yeah. thing, it, it did it. It changed it. The, uh, I, the I just the, wish they stayed on the hook better. Jesus God, they're so bad. They're yeah. The, the uh the tournament where Patrick Walters did, did real good. Uh he was going through his up up north for the small mile. Okay. Uh, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before. Uh, uh was it MPFL? No, I don't think so. Maybe it was. I don't remember what who if it was bass or MPFL. But I remember he opens his box up and right there sits gulp minnows. And I'm going, he knows. Every, <laughs> he yeah, knows. dude. Everybody knows. And and yeah. then the last thing is go online, everyone listening, you buy the jug because then you can shove all your other like so get like the panorama shad. Yeah. yeah. Get a get a bunch of those and just throw it in the juice. It's just oh my goodness. It it, it does. It really does. Um, it, and it's fascinating because I like like this dynamic here where I'm talking about two foot deep creeks and then you're in 58 feet of water right now. <laughs> um, what's the heaviest head you've gotten away with and had success? Oh, God, you're going to make me give stuff away. Um, okay, so, let's do this. Is it uh, under, under 10 ounces? And is it over yeah, four yeah. ounces? Well, I'll, I'll tell you. So my go-to, like... Well, what are we talking about fishing on it, though? That's just, the question. Well, I'm just saying with 80 feet of water in general, like, so one thing I'm experimenting with, which I talked about, is like... Now, that's wintertime. They don't go quite that deep during the summer. But during the summer, let's say we're talking about, like, like my go-to, like, for years and years and years, ledge fishing. My go-to was, you know, a five or six inch, and it was on a half ounce head because I could fish it real slow. Now... Something that I'm also learning <laughs> with forward facing sonar is if those bass are super active, or yeah. if you want to get a reaction strike, I got a buddy that makes heads, you know, for swim baits that go all the way up to an ounce and a half. And I'll throw them out there. He makes, God, he makes underspins for these that are like an ounce and three eighths. And you want to talk about firing them up when you can throw that out there in 20 foot of water and just, I mean, they go crazy. The heaviest I did was four ounces and we were fishing Kiwi. We had to go get saltwater jig heads. This is because again, mm. we were in college. Kiwi is crazy deep, dude, crazy it, clear. 
if it wasn't for college that forced us to fish those places, that's how I got yeah. good fishing deep. But we went to Bass Pro Shop and got um, like these striper jig heads for saltwater, painted yeah. them, and we would do screw locks for our our blades yeah. to make a to make an underspin. But so you have this this thing that would just you had like a swim bait catfish rod to chuck this damn thing. But like you said, with that that heavier head, you can crank that son of a bitch hard yeah. and keep it down through the school. Yeah. Um, but then I guess my question to that is like, we figured out when we broke two rods, you have to change all your crap to get that set up right. And then at that yeah. point, what is it? Because like an underspin in and of itself is supposed to be finessey, but if you're using an ounce or up to us three ounces, yeah. you're not using eight pound test to chuck no. that bitch. So no. what do you do? For me, I mean, I'm throwing 90% of the time, like I'm throwing, but you know, again, I, like I'm, I'm fishing 80 foot deep with three pound test line for, you know, three, four, five pound smallmouth too. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm throwing a lot of times 12 and 15 pound test. Like my go-to weight is 12 pound test on a, on a spinner bait or, or on a, uh, uh, underspin during the summer, but I know for the most part, like I'm not fishing that on the bottom. I'm not fishing yeah. it through a lot of brush or weeds or that sort of stuff. So when I do set the hook on that fish, I know pretty much, I just have to keep him out of the trolling motor, the boat motor and off the boat itself, you know, but now I still um, got to get him in and you know, I'm not fishing Florida. So more, the likelihood of him being 12 pounds is slim to none. So, you know, you're going to, you're still going to drag that wonderful little three pounder in, you know? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And we got so many questions. I apologize, Chad, for not getting to these questions. So we'll get to these now since we're hitting almost the two hour mark here. Uh, we have, we have, we have Matthew here. What are your guys' favorite trout uh, imitators? Oh my goodness. I'm going to say in June, like I'm still, I'm going to fish the Huddlestons because I can get them down so deep and swim them so, so slow. The problem is that the industry has not made a shit ton of trout imitators and the OGs are kind of the best. I, I would say like uh, fish, everything makes a great glide trout when that yeah. kicks in, but it's going to be the HUD. It's going to be a, a glide bait, generally speaking. And then I will yeah. say the way the Virginia state record will be broken is somebody is going to figure out when they start dumping trout in all the places and you will just drive around with a HUD and a glide and you will hit yep. all those ponds and lakes when they dump trout because there is a pond up near me. It's Jim Burnett Park. And you don't think there's a bass in there. But as soon as they dump trout, Jesus God, the amount <laughs> of fish that come out of the woodwork that are four or five pounds that just know after years and that and that yep. dinner bell gets turned on. It's insane. See, that's the thing down here. Like I can't fish ponds because the only ponds down here, because it's all mountains. So yeah. the people that have a pond, they've dammed up some, you know, hauler as we call uh. them and most time they got cows or it's private and around here if you sneak in you get it's shot. you get shot then they call the cops <laughs> it's not we're gonna call the cops it's wow you dead <laughs> <laughs> let me call 911 and get this crazy sob off my property <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Ricky, Ricky Falk, uh, have you tried the, oh my God, t -cackle? vibrating bait uh like the chatter bait but a bigger blade it's on the list but i have not I, that to me is like getting to what chatter baits are getting to now is like with the i collect lipless baits like it's a, a very bad issue <laughs> i love going on ebay and looking for old types of baits because you can find unique sounds that aren't made anymore yes the more they mess around with the blades on chatter baits i think in a generation you're gonna see that we're like oh it's that blade that's never made anymore it's gonna have that yeah. vibration yes uh, let's see. And we got a couple more here to get through all these questions. Uh, Bass and uh, I really like the hovering crankbait you showed a while back on your channel. A hovering crankbait? Is that just a crankbait that never hits bottom? Or is it specifically a crankbait? Huh. I don't remember this. That's a good place when you've had so many episodes yeah. or, or pieces of content. You're like, oh crap! I don't like the hovering crankbait. Like, I mean, is it? Are you talking about the spy bait? Oh, maybe he's talking about like is he talking about the one that stands on end? I don't remember. Let's see. We got Travis here. Travis says Highland reservoirs and clear water lakes can be difficult for me to break down sometimes. Example is Lake Muma. Lake Muma, I guess, is up eighty one a little bit. Uh, it's I guess it's a little far from you. 
I don't know really like it, it really depends on bait fish. That's, that's the first thing I start. Like I've got a couple of lakes around here that I want to go, go fish. I will tell you this, what I've learned about bass, even out in open water, if you don't have live scope, the whole nine yards, right? I learned this previous and it's, it's one of the few things that have proven right after live scope. Whatever the depth level that you can see, put your glasses on. I I, I, I got an old white tube. I call it the test tube. <laughs> and I just hook it on something, drop it over the side, see how far I can see, right? Because the bass are going to see much better than you think they can. Um, and once I see that and I know, say I've got 15-foot visibility, that I can see that tube, even just a tiny bit, generally I'm going to start fishing in the areas that look good that are just below that visibility cutoff and 10 to 15 feet below it. Start focusing on those areas, those, those areas that are, are standout areas. So if you've got five feet, focus on, you know, focus on that five, 10 foot area, that five and 15. I was even on, I mean, I'll give this away. I don't care. Like I was even, it was below freezing. We're on Norris Lake. I pull up in this bay because I see a bunch of shad five foot deep, five foot visibility. The shad are five foot deep. The bass are up there chasing them like sharks in 42 degree water. So, I mean, February, right? February, they're up shallow. Now, they wouldn't hit a BR head or not a BR, I was throwing a jaw dropper at the time. And a jaw dropper is much like a BR, it's very wide, but I could take it through that shad and walk it. And then once they seen it, stop and shake it and they'd buy it. But start, you know, at that visibility line, five, you know, 10 to 15 feet below it. That's where the majority of your bass are generally gonna be located. That is the coolest thing in that live scope. Again, it's just these things that have just been proven wrong. Like the fish are just, they don't bite certain baits in the winter time. Yeah. And that's just been blown the hell out of the water because of live scope. And this is science has told us this too. And it, we now have evidence that that's just not correct at all. Yeah. You know, I've seen smallmouth spawning in 15 foot of water. You know, I've, I've seen largemouth with my eyes spawning in 15 foot of water and clear. And everybody will argue if you talk to any, you know, by, bio, bio, you know, biology scientist, you know, they'll tell you, no, they'll, I can't tell you how many of them will say, no, man, largemouth will never spawn that deep. Yes, they will. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing it now. We're able to prove it. We got uh, Bassin with Big Malone. Have you spent time on the James? I have not. I've never been there. I'd like to go. I'd like to go to the Potomac, but it scares the crap out of me because I'm used to driving over 120 foot of water. And for me to be in like five foot, you want to talk about a rear, you know, butthole sucking to the seat. I'd be scared to death. I'd have to take somebody that knew how to drive it. Well, that's, and this is a great little kind of thing to end on too, is what are the parts of your game that you want to work on the most? Is it just shallow, weedy, Okeechobee, Florida, tidal stuff? Yeah, I've got to get better at the grass game. If there's one thing that is probably the, because we just don't have it here. Like, I've got to drive five hours to get to that, you know. Uh, Chickamauga, four, is that the closest? Four. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Wow. And it, it's it's uh, Chattanooga. I think it's four hours from where I'm at. So, you know, I mean, that's something that I've got to get better at uh, to be able to, to to do the things that I want to do. So we got a question. I agree. Okay. So we got Hoff, Hoffman04 on Instagram agreed to understand patterns. You need diversity with the water. Uh, we also have Shane Flynn Outdoors, who just said on Instagram, uh, just sub to you that this channel is awesome. Again, StreamYards, please get it so I can share questions from Instagram. This is bullshit that you I still agree. Why do issue. they not have that? I don't know. It's just so dumb. I you mean, is it to it? I'm pretty sure it runs on the same platform now that Facebook does. It got, they own the damn thing. Yeah. It makes no yeah. sense. 
Uh, let's see, Ricky, the grass is coming back uh, in the James. It is coming back. The James is going to be on fire. It's in a little lull right now, but it's going to be coming back. And I think it's what's so this. The one thing that makes an angler really good, I will agree with that, is the ability that if you grow up on clear water that you can be transplanted to, to grass. I've gotten to interview a lot of people from the North Carolina area because of Kerr and Gaston. And it's so funny how many of them are like, they just quake in their boots when they're like, you want me to go to the Potomac and sit for eight hours and not move? <laughs> and it's like, to me, where I live, that's okay. Yeah, that's what you do. But to them, it's like, I need to burn a whole tank of gas and run 200 waypoints or it's yeah. not a good day. See, I, I think for me, like I've got used to doing that on, uh, you know, ledge fishing because you find a good ledge, you don't leave it because somebody else is going to move in on it and you just sit there trying to fire those bass up a lot of times. But th that's also because one of the one of the things that you'll learn when you get a forward-facing sonar is how horrible of an angler you actually are because there are so... <laughs> Yes. many fish so many fish out there that you didn't think was out there and uh you know and and that's the one thing like ledge fishing i think it was it was the ability for me to be able to uh because i'll take friends out and teach them and they'll get stuck chasing these fish and i'll be like okay man it's time to go they're not biting let's go find some more and ledge fishing you learn that uh because you may have you know four, five, eight, ten schools, but that day, a lot of times only one of those schools are going to be red hot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so in a tournament, sometimes if everybody knows you got to camp, but at other times, you know, when you're out there fun fishing, you know, you, you got to run those schools to figure out which one's firing and which, which one or two are going to fire that day. So I've got, really good and thank god because i would be like my buddies who chase the same three fish for five hours and never catch it <clears throat> i've got good at understanding okay these i've got these baits i know they should bite them i know i've caught fish on them they're not reacting to them i'm leaving you know i'm not going to sit here and waste time it's like it's it's spawn fishing but it's video game and if you understand how to, how to catch a fish off a of bed you understand the same principles yes. of a bed applies to forward facing very sonar. good analogy very good yes. uh shane says i caught a tank because of forward facing sonar he also says oh let's see let's see but before you end could you recap the top baits so this is how we do it i'm i'm, I'm sorry. getting yeah i'm getting more tizzy here which is <laughs> We're talking Highland reservoirs and I'm talking river smallmouth. I'm gonna have somebody else on that's gonna go tidal water and so on and so forth to get really niche. Uh basically micro ned rig, you're gonna do a swim jig. We, I didn't even touch top water tonight. That could be a whole nother thing. And also a micro glide bait this time of year uh, for smallmouth works extremely well. And then you mentioned earlier in the show your top baits for 30 feet of water. Yeah. Well, and, and I'll run down real quick. Like, like I'll tell you right now, like my top five for what I'm going to be doing, and I'm going to be scoping a lot this summer. Uh, it's going to be a small spoon, believe it or not, not a big spoon. Now, if I'm on a lake, it's got big shad. Yes, I'll do that. But, but I, I've been kind of keeping this under wraps, but small spoons, uh, and I put crank wraps on them so they don't flash as much and they look like a gizzard shad you know, dull. It's, it's going to be a minnow bait of some kind. And you know, it's probably going to be a gulp. Um, <laughs> we're, uh, it's probably going to be, uh, definitely a top water, two different top waters. One is of course going to be my heading because it's smooth. I can walk it like a glide. They'll call up. The other is going to be a popper of some sort. And I love the prank because it's got that lip. Mm. And if they're not willing to bust, you can crank it down and they'll, they'll hit it while they chase it. And then number five, it's probably going to be some sort of swim bait, big, small, wherever I can throw that in there. There you guys go. We got two more questions here. Cause we'll make sure we get everyone answered here. Logan says when ledge fishing, which directions are you moving the baits? So I always start with the natural current. So that's always going to be my first lineup. Yeah. So, so I'm always going to start if the current, even if I'm in, let's say, let's say I'm in, you know, let's say I'm on Douglas, right? If I'm on Douglas and, and they're not generating, I'm still going to start in a position where the current from the river is coming down Lake, right? Because mm -hmm. there's still going to be some sort of water movement. 
Now, that being said, when it comes over points and humps, you get turbulence, you get eddies, just like it. So, so I always say when I set up on something, I'm going to set up deep, shallow, left and right. I'm going to do the four corners. And if I don't get bites on two, three baits doing that, I'm moving it. I'm not sitting there all day, even if I see fish. And I'd add to that too, um, Logan, do you have forward facing sonar? If you do, a trout never sets up in a river ass backwards. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, and so even if it's a minute bit of a current on any TVA system or a river or like what have you, the fish is always going to be positioned to where the, the bait in the forge is going yeah. to be flowing past him. So I would say if you have that technology, which way are they position and that's that's your cast one and then all your angles. I hate this yeah. stupid light will <laughs> will go off of that. Yeah, and, and a lot of times it's just coming at them from a different, because everybody's throwing, that's really, it's everybody's going to throw that way. So sometimes, you know, if they're not reacting, change that angle, go up on top of that point or hump and throw out deep and come out. And sometimes it's just the change of the angle that'll get them fired up. I, I also, actually, based on what I just said, because I have never, I've rarely casted downriver and reeled up and had a lot of success. Oh. Have you actually gone from their ass to their mouth, sort of speaking? Yes. How successful yes. is that? It's really successful on the That's Tennessee crazy. River. Like, especially on the ledges. Like, if you throw down and come up, you know, they're just they're just sitting there and it's reaction, it just comes it? bomb. Yeah. Mm. And that's that's something I was gonna say. We were talking about weights the other day. The best way I've found open water to get them to bite a swim bait now is if they're coming at you. And you use a little heavier head and you throw out there and you zoom it past them. Because hmm. when you zoom it past them, they just react to it. They they can't help it. Like it comes up behind them and they're like, oh, you know, what are you doing? Cat to a laser pointer. Yeah, exactly. And I think I think you touched on something where like that's why the minnow bite's dying is it's not reactionary. It's they have to sit and and look at it. Look at and it. And whether it's I mean I've had success with like a Nico rig right now yeah. over over top of them, but I've seen that the Nico rig using the little Nico rig is starting to die too because they yeah. are they're just sitting there and they're just staring at that thing and the yeah, fast god i love this stuff it's it's so fascinating to find that tweak shane says uh no big hair jig great ledge fishing bait yeah it, it listen i love my hair jigs you know if you go what if you go back to my videos like i i've fished them forever and i fish them a little bit different than a lot of people do like i my go-to is an ounce because i like to move them fast and so i'll throw an ounce out there in you know 15 20 foot and I like to give it a couple of turns and really let it come up. And when it comes up and then it falls down, those bass will nose on it. And a lot of times when you give it those two or three turns again and it jumps, man, that's when they hit it. It's that reaction by I'll do spoons that way too. A spoon, I, man, gosh, I, I've, I've started sharing this a little bit. But a spoon, a lot of times, even if they don't bite it, it gets them tired. I've never seen any fire bait up. fire up bass. And I've seen this now on the live scope. And again, I've used big spoons, little spoons, but I've never seen any bait fire bass up, whether it be open water or on the ledges, like a spoon does, even if they don't eat it. And if you see them start darting at it and they don't touch it, then you pick a minnow bait up or a soft jerk bait with a, like a belly weight, like mm. something that I've done forever is put a, uh, I like the Strike King, not sponsored by Strike King again, uh, Strike King, uh, but they're, uh, they're ghost shad in clear water with a belly weighted hook. Uh, it literally is like this milky shad color in clear water. And, and I use it as a follow-up too. Like if I'm throwing big swim baits and I'm cranking it and they're just going tap, 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 tap. I'll pick that bait up and throw behind them because it just sits there and flutters. And then I just go one, two, three, straight up like a dying shad and then let it fall. Those fish are stupid, man. They don't know. I just pulled that swim bait out of the water and they hit it 52 times. They crush that thing. That's a lost art is having a backup bait ready. I don't it know is. why, but a lot no of people do it for that. like frogs or, you know, that sort of stuff, you know, having a Senko or flipping bait, but open water, it works. Like if I go out there and I throw a minnow bait by some fish and they don't eat it, I will pick up a 
a, a mojo spoon, a half ounce. I mean, you don't have to have any special equipment for that or the three inch uh, or the three, I think it's like 3.75. Uh, gosh, what is it? Like Texas. Anyway, it's by Nichols. Uh, mm. Throw it out there and just hop it up by them two or three times. And if they go crazy, you can throw that minnow bait or that jerk bait in and they'll eat it. They will flat eat it after that. So, so interesting. Dude, I, I, what do you have coming up? I don't want to keep you here all along. I know you got to get up tomorrow and actually be an adult. Um, no, I, I work nights tomorrow, so I'm sleeping in because uh, I've got to work 6.30 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. So I'm sleeping in, so I got nothing. Do you have anything coming up that we can promote or, or anything else? Like oh, that? like that. Oh, okay. Or, or that too. <laughs> Uh, you know, not really, man, you know, guys just go check the channel out. You know, like I said, I mean, I want to do this full time, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just a weekend warrior. Like I don't get to fish more than one to two days a week. And, you know, and my wife wants, wants to beat me when I do that, because, you know, I am working, uh, you know, a full time job and doing the YouTube thing full time. And, you know, I just want to get out there, get better and share more of these little secrets and tips with you. I mean, that's what I love to do. Uh, yes. I want to fish. I want to fish tournaments, but like, I just want to help you guys catch fish. That's, that has been my goal from day one. And, uh, you know, that's what we're going to talk about. You, you may not, you may see a how to where I don't even catch fish on it, but I can tell you, it catches fish. It's, I'm not there to show you how I can do it because if I'm talking about it, I've done it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I want to, I just want you guys to go do it and hopefully be ahead of the curve. We need more people like you on YouTube and stuff. Cause like, and again, it's just the pop culture thing right now. The trend is just the, the, the echo chambers, the clickbaity stuff versus what I really think YouTube is, has always been teaching first. It's how to change a light bulb. It's how yeah. to do a tie. It's how to throw yeah. a bait. It's, it's an evolution of Google search basically yeah. is what it is. Um, you know, and with information there, uh, Greg, to answer your question, uh, on the 17th, we will have the legend Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake on the show again for Monday night live. Oh. The awesome. 17th, he's going to do another two hour breakdown in the summertime on Smith. So that will get your fix there. Uh, as always, guys, uh, I really appreciate everyone that has listened tonight. I know it's the summertime and people are super busy. Please like, subscribe to the channel, it really helps out in the algorithm. If you'd like to go check us out on Patreon, because of Patreon is the only reason we can do this. We're a local show, we don't get sponsors. If it wasn't for you guys, none of this is possible. Like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.